Uh, before I begin, <clears throat> uh, I want to just say that uh, uh, this year should be for a Rufo Shlema for Rina Bas So, <clears throat> and also this year should be uh, for a merit for the health and success of the families of Regina Bas Yosef Ruuvim and Yeshai Ben Yisrael and Binyamin Wolf, Ben Tzvi Hersh, and Baruch Ben Binyamin Wolf. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, we are in the midst of Sukkot, so I think it's, uh, it's uh, appropriate uh, that I give a sheer about Sukkot, or Sukkot, because Sukkot really is a very strange holiday um, when you really think about it. You know, every holiday has a meaning. It's usually tied to a significant historical event. Now, obviously, Pesach is a tie to who? It's tied to the Yitziat Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt. You can't get too much more significant than that. Ashavuot is tied to what? It is tied to uh-huh. Matan Torah, right? It's tied to the giving of the Torah. And, and you have Hanukkah, which is the, the, tied to the uh, Greeks trying to take over and the freedom from the Greeks uh, to rededicate the temple. Uh, and then you have Purim, of course, where the whole Jewish people were saved from being destroyed by Haman. I mean, these are very pivotal significant events. Uh, what about Sukkot? Well, Chazal, Chazal uh, the rabbi has offered two explanations. I mean, Sukkot is filled with mitzvahs, if you think about it. You have the Sukkah, you have the four species, right? Uh, the Lulu of the Esrei, Hadas Menarovas, right? Then you have other things going on in Sukkot. You have Hushan Rabbo, you have the banging of Hoshanas on the ground. You have Simchat Torah. A lot of significant stuff on Sukkot. Well, we would expect some major historical event. Uh, so what is the reason? Well, to commemorate, it's Machlokas, an argument. One is to commemorate the fact that they had uh, Sukkot sh- uh, shacks or huts in the desert. And the other one, because of the Anani HaKovod, because there were clouds of glory that actually surrounded uh, the Jewish people to protect them. It was amazing. It was totally surrounded. Imagine uh, millions of people, clouds around to protect them uh, from, uh, from the desert or the wilderness and so on. But wait a minute, there's something very strange here, you know. And what's the significance of that? What are we talking about? <clears throat> yeah, it's a miracle that clouds surrounded the Jewish people. But why is that a significant event? I mean, Jews have experienced many miracles. This doesn't seem in any which way to uh, equal any of the other holidays, right? So then what is going on here? Uh, and Sukkot has many mitzvahs, mitzvot. It has the sukkah, right? You know, where you're supposed to sit in the sukkah for uh, seven days or eight days, whatever. Uh, if you're in Israel or America, whatever. All right. Then it has the lulav and esrog, uh, the four species that you're supposed to wave, right? You have that. Then you have the um, korbonus. You have many things going on with the Beit HaMikdash, right? You have Simchat Torah. Uh, or like, what is going on? That's the question. Sukkot doesn't seem to commemorate anything really significant in terms of, you know, uh, what the other holidays signify. That's a very great mystery. What exactly is Sukkot all about? You know, uh, and that's, so that's one of the things I want to talk about in fact, Sukkot is probably one of the most significant of all holidays. Uh, the problem is most people don't know. They don't think. They don't know. 
you know, so what have they got to say? I mean, I've, I've heard all kinds of explanations. You know, I mean, most of them are superficial or they're downright wrong. What I'd like to do tonight is offer, right, a, an understanding of Sukkot that is phenomenally great, you see. And you'll understand what the historical event was that happened. Ah, so that's the question. What exactly is the Pnimiyut? Is the internal understanding of Sukkot, especially like what I've said, it doesn't seem to commemorate anything deserving of a major holiday. I mean, Sukkot, Sukkot is a major holiday. We're not looking here at one-day holiday. I mean, anything that goes on for eight, nine days in America has got to be incredible. What is it? Uh, that is the question. And if you do understand what it is, then you will be able to understand many of its mitzvot, its minhagim, its traditions. You really have a grip and understanding of it all. It really makes sense. So, in order to understand sukkahs, you have to understand something which unfortunately most people are not familiar with. And Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzatoy, the Ramchal, mentions it, he talks about it, and uh, it's amazing how few people know this, yet it is incredibly important. And let me tell you what it is. <clears throat> how does God run the world? That is the question. He runs it employing three types of behaviors. In fact, you could say that the actions of God, right, is complete, can be basically completely explained in one of employing one of these three behaviors. What are they? That, that's a bold statement. Well, the first concept, uh, so a behavior is called the anhogo. The anhogo. It's a behavior, an action of God. Uh, so, the first action that I want to talk about is called the anhogos hakiyum. Is those actions of God that he does to give, to fulfill the purpose of creation. I mean, why did he make creation? You see? So it fulfills the purpose. That's called Anogos Hakim. The actions that God does in, in, in light of what he wants to, why the creation itself even exists. Uh, you see? And what does that involve? Well, he creates the entire... Uh, um, celestial worlds, the worlds above us. He creates Oilam Hazer, right? He creates our world. He creates all the hundred million species of beings, creatures, whatever. He creates man. He creates the mountains, everything. For what? For the purpose of declaring, do you believe in a supreme being or not. And I'm not going to get into obviously the whole agenda because I've dealt with that extensively. But that's called Anavas Akim. He creates man and the whole background of man, everything, in order to fulfill the purpose of creation. So that's the first Anhogo, the first actions of God. Uh, next Anhogo is now since God gave mankind free will. Right, which obviously means that they can choose to do whatever they would like, basically, right? So then God waits for them to to uh, actually perform or to do whatever they choose, and He waits, and He will respond with what is called mishpat, justice. So that's what God does. So then God performs actions that respond to man's actions. It's called justice, you see. So if a person sins, then God will try to warn him, and if not, the person doesn't repent, then he will punish him. You see, so that's an action of God. If a person does good, God will not, uh, will not reward him because the reward of a mitzvah cannot be sustained in this world. 
It's infinitely greater than the world. But God will give him a greater opportunity to do more mitzvahs. You see, for instance, he will allow this person to become wealthy. So he will have a tremendous amount of money to do more mitzvahs. Uh, so in a certain sense, that of course is mishpat, justice, because since you do a mitzvah, right, then I will enable you to do more mitzvahs or greater mitzvahs or whatever. Anyway, that's called anangas mishpat, the actions or the behavior that God does, right, that is in consequence of man's acts, and it conforms to the concept called justice. Uh, so that's the second thing. And then there's a third series of actions, which most people are unfamiliar with. What is that? That's called the Anhogas Hayichud. It is the acts of a being that is over everything, is superior to everything. Uh, what does that mean? Because if you look at something, you'll notice that if man has free will, that's a big problem. Because it is possible for everybody to sin. And if everybody sins, right, then there will be no future world. Nothing. And that will frustrate the will of God. Now, God gave man the ability to do that because he's got free will. <clears throat> so it is certainly theoretically possible for all mankind to sin, Right? For all mankind to sin. And as a result of that, uh, mankind, like I say, will frustrate the will of God. Uh, now, and this is the result. Now, you're going to say to yourself, well, the, you know what the likelihood of that? That all men, all mankind, sins constantly, so God has to destroy them? And the answer is, of course it happened. That was the marble. <clears throat> mankind sinned so grievously that God destroyed the entire world. And he only left Noach and his children alive. <clears throat> so we see that it did happen. That because mankind has free will, it is possible for everybody to sin, necessitating the destruction of the entire world. And that's incredible. So therefore what God does is very interesting. He institutes a a series of actions that guarantees that the world will achieve its tikkun, that the world will achieve its rectification. In other words, it's not possible for mankind to destroy itself or to destroy Ilam Hazer, this world. In other words, there must be, there must be a future world and there must be a nation in that future world and there's a series of actions that God utilizes to make sure this happens now justice doesn't demand that it means if you do something you do A then B will happen right it doesn't justify a guarantee or a backup plan uh, yet that is what God did so there's a series of actions that is called the Anagas Yichud, which is the actions of one who is above everything, even above justice, and that he will make sure that the world has a kiyum, uh, a, 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 a continuation of existence. Now the interesting thing about that is that nobody knows how that works. In other words, it is very mysterious. Because what it means is that in order to make sure that the world will sustain itself, no matter what mankind does, God has to employ different actions that seem completely contradictory to what he said about himself. That's where you see evil people dominating. Evil people being successful, you see. And you see good people suffering terribly. Good people not being successful. That's what you see. So in many ways, it is a contradiction 
to what God says about himself and the way he runs the world, you see. Uh, so we don't really know how it works, but it is there, and it does guarantee the existence of the world, that there must be an ulam habo, there must be a future world, and there must be a nation, people, in that future world, benefiting, uh, you know, perpetually, eternally, and so on. <clears throat> okay, so now that we understand this, it is now possible to understand a very important series of events. Now, the problem is this. Who is guaranteed? What nation is guaranteed to exist? And the idea is that in the beginning, this Hanhogas HaYichud, this series of actions that's a backup system that guarantees the existence of man was not directed at any single nation. Nothing. It was guaranteed that mankind must survive. Uh, so when Adam Horishan was created, right, he was the only person in the Chava. So they were guaranteed to, that the world must continue even if Adam sins. So that's what happened. That Odom, Mauritian, and Chavo, they sinned. Now, they, what should have happened is they should have died. But God doesn't want to do that. So he continues. There seems to be a constant noise. Somebody has to close In any case... Someone mute yourself. Press star six. Yeah. Star six? Yes. Okay, Gloria. Star... Okay. <clears throat> this is what seems to be going on. So, Odd Mauritian, in other words, Hanover Sayyichud you know, would activate itself even in the time of Adam, so Adam couldn't die because that would be the end of the human race. You see, so Adam was punished in whatever, because um, remember, that series of actions that guarantees the survival of man is not directed in any particular being, but it is directed at the human race. It's a very important concept. Now, uh, so he sinned, we move on to the next. Then you have Cain and Evel. There's only two people around, or whatever. Anyway... We know Cain killed Hevel, right? But if you kill Cain, right, then who's left, basically? So therefore God allowed Cain to exist until he could have, you know, to reproduce whatever they, they did, right? Uh, so the Anogas HaYichud, you know, again, guaranteed the survival of the human race. And in, in the beginning, it had to guarantee the survival of people who actually sinned. Uh, then you come to who? Then you come to after uh, 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 Cain, you go further, and then everybody begins sitting. And finally, you get to the generation of Noach. Now, the sinning then was so bad that God decided to destroy the world. But wait a minute, you can't do that. Because, you know, there has to be somebody left, Right? That will continue the Tikkun process, the process of restoring or rectifying the creation, right? There has to be somebody. So therefore, in a certain sense, Noach obviously fulfilled that. So the Anogas HaYichud, right? Those guarantee actions fell or were directed at Noach and his children, you see? And therefore they survived to carry on the human race. I mean, if you think about it, we are all descendants, not just from Adam, but for, even from Noach, because he took the place of Adam, right, after God destroyed the world. But remember, the Anhoga, the actions, the guarantee, right, is not directed at a particular person that he must survive, but it is directed at mankind. Somebody's got to survive. Until we get to Avraham Avinu, 
Now, Avram Avinu is a very interesting person. I don't want to go into the whole thing because I've already spoken about this. But God decided to take his covenant, his agreement, <clears throat> that mankind must bring back God into the creation. He decided to bestow it on Avram Avinu and take it away from the other people that lived then. Because again, mankind had sinned terribly, you see. So he didn't want to destroy mankind for whatever reason. So he just spread them out throughout the planet. And he changed their languages. So now there was no such thing as one nation. Now it was many nations. Uh, but he did say to Avram Avinu, right, okay, I'm going to make what's called the Brisbane Absurum, the covenant between the pieces, which is in Bracious, in Genesis. And he did say that you will, uh, you will do my will, which is through the mitzvot, and I, you will inherit the, la and the land, which means that's the contract. You know, you do my will, commandments, and you will inherit Olam Habo. Uh, so Avram Avinu said to God, which is very interesting, a very astute person, obviously. So he said, wait a minute, you know, your guarantee or backup plan, in other words, in other words what, what God used Avram Avinu as a guarantee that somebody in mankind has to do the will of God to bring the tikkun. And God was now going to make the deal with Avram Avinu. You see? Even though he allowed, without getting into that, mankind to survive in their own way. But now the contract was only with Avram Avinu. So that's how God fulfilled that Anogas HaYichud, that guarantee plan. Oh, because now we have a nation that's going to do the will of God. <clears throat> so Avram Avinu said something very interesting. He said, wait a minute. You know, it's great. Right? But what happens if the Jews sin? Because the problem is that the Anhogas HaYichud, this backup plan, is not directed at a nation. It's directed that somebody in mankind has to survive. Right? <clears throat> so what happens if the Jewish people, my descendants, if they sin terribly, which is possible, which of course did happen many times, where the Jews sinned so bad that they were Chayav Misa. They should have been destroyed. We see that by Haman. There was a Xero decree that whatever sin they did deserved the destruction, the, the annihilation of the whole Jewish people. Right? Of course, it didn't happen, but it was directed at them. As Avram Avinu said, <clears throat> look, you destroyed the entire world, even if you kept Noach alive. So the Anogah Sayyid is not directed at a nation. It's just directed that mankind has to survive. So what you're going to do is you're going to destroy the Jews and make a covenant with somebody else. You see, because the guarantee is not on a single nation. It is on mankind. So it could be on any nation that you deem favorable for this task. That's what Avraham Avinu said to God. And the Bansham said, you know, what you say is very good. What I'm going to do is change an aspect of the actual Anogas Yichud. I'm going to guarantee, right, not just that mankind survives, but that the Jewish people survive. Wow. Oh, that's incredible. That means the Jewish people can never be destroyed because that's what Anogas Yichud does. So because of Avram Avinu's statement, then God said, I'm going to direct the Anogas HaYichud. No, in other words, those series of actions which I will do to guarantee the survival, right, that there has to be somebody in Olim Habo, the future world, right, uh, this will now apply only to the Jews, you see. And therefore, they become indestructible. That's amazing, you see. And therefore, God made a covenant with Avram Avinu, which is an agreement, and he went through pieces of animals, that's how they used to do it in those days, whatever. <clears throat> in any case, and um, he went through as two different symbols. If you look at the Chumash, this is what it says. He went through as a tremendous flaming torch, 
fire, right? And he went to as a smoking furnace. Those were the two symbols that God went through the pieces, signifying that he will act two ways to the Jews. What does this mean? It means if the Jews do the mitzvahs, which means to bring the tikkun, then God will appear to them as a light, tremendous, awesome light. But if they don't and they sin, then God will appear to them as a smoking furnace. And Rashi says that symbolizes Gehenna. It symbolizes hell, as they say in English, right? That means punishment. And that was the backup. In other words, I, the backup system is a great deal of punishment, right? And I will bring that upon the Jews, you see, because the Anogah Sayyichud now guarantees the survival of the Jews, not only the survival of mankind, but the Jews are now indestructible. So Avram Avinu got what he did. <clears throat> so we go further by Martin Torah, the giving of the Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu, the sin, all of a sudden God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, get down because your nation has corrupted themselves. You see, so Moshe Rabbeinu is carrying the Luchas tablets and he goes down and he sees they're all worshipping or whatever, they're worshipping a golden calf. So he takes the tablets and he throws it at the bottom of the mountain and shatters it. You see, <clears throat> and Moshe Rabbeinu knew this is very bad news because this really would entitle the Jews to annihilation. That's how bad it was. So Moshe Rabbeinu, so this happened on the 17th day of Tammuz. That's right, Shivas Tammuz. So Moshe Rabbeinu now goes up to the mountain again, turns around, goes up into the mountain, wherever that, you know, Mount Sinai, right? And he's now arguing with God. This is the second 40 days, you see. Uh, the first 40 days is the way he received the Torah, the, the Ten Commandments. The second 40 days is he's now going up to argue with God, right? What does that mean? To argue and try to appease God, not to destroy the Jews. Um, but wait a minute. God can't destroy the Jews because the Anogah Sayyichud guarantees their survival. You see. So I can't destroy them. So now we understand something very important. Um, that God said to Moshe, I will make you a great nation. You see. I'm God, a great nation. And you will become the Of. You will father the, 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 uh, the Jewish people. In other words, I'm going to wipe out all the Jews, and you will stay alive, <clears throat> and from you, you will have children, and they will have children, and they will become the new Jewish people. So God needed Moshe Rabbeinu to survive. In other words, to take over what Avraham Avinu and the others did. Because he had no out, he had no exit. You see, because he promised Avram Avinu uh, that the Anogas Ayichud, right, would apply to the Jews. So you can't annihilate them, but he could, because he's got somebody that will take the place of the Jews. Who is that? A Jew himself, Moshe Rabbeinu. You see, that's why God promised Moshe, or he said to Moshe, I will make you the great nation. So Moshe Rabbeinu realized this, and he said, no. Erase me from your sefer, which means if you annihilate them, you must annihilate me also. <clears throat> I don't want to survive. So when Moshe Rabbeinu was taking the exit that God had, so therefore God said, well, I mean, what choice did God have? You can't compel somebody to do this. So God said, Solachti kidvorecho which we repeat on Yom Kippur, I have forgiven you according to your words. What does that mean? It means I have to forgive the Jews. Why? Because I have nobody else to take it on. And I promised Avram that the Nogas HaYichud would protect and make the Jews survive. So I can't annihilate them because you refuse to take over. So therefore I have to forgive them. 
It's amazing what Moshe Rabbeinu did. He saved the Jewish people. You know, what a lawyer you make. Imagine, you have to know, you see, it's amazing. To lead the Jewish people, you have to be tremendous in Hashkofa. You have to know exactly what is going on. So you could use this as an argument, especially to save the Jews. You see? So because Moshe Rabbeinu, of course, he knew Hanukkah Zayichud, right? And he knew that it applied to the Jews. By refusing to accept God's offer, really, God had no choice. So he saved the Jewish people, you see. But then Moshe Rabbeinu, again, pleaded that, wait a minute, because he was now afraid that, wait a minute, so he's going to save the Jewish. He's not going to kill them, right? And he's going to save the Jewish people, right? So Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to make sure that God doesn't take another nation, right, as a, to hedge against if the Jews sin or not. So that was the next concern of Moshe. First, you've got to save them, right? And then you've got to get them back into, then you've got to uh, make sure that God will not pick another nation. Because God can say, okay, I'll save them. I won't destroy them, right? But I'm going to have somebody else do the tikkun. So Moshe Rabbeinu said, wait a minute. You can't, please don't do that. He, be, he begged God that God should not allow some other nation to do the tikkun. That it should only remain with the Jews and with nobody else. And God said, okay. So that's the second thing that Moshe Rabbeinu did. Well, now the Jews remain in the tikkun process, basically. But the only nation... You see, then of course, Moshe Rabbeinu prayed for the last 40 days that the Jews, God should renew his contract with the Jews, which God said, okay. And therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu came down, in a certain sense, for the third time on Yom Kippur. That's why Yom Kippur is a day of forgiveness, because on that day, God forgave the Jews for the Chet Ego. You see, <clears throat> now what's interesting is this is that when the Jews sinned at the golden calf, the clouds left. And the Vilna Goyen says this, the clouds left, because what the clouds really symbolized is that the Anogah Sayyich applies to the Jews, that they cannot be destroyed. And therefore they had this incredible cloud protection. But it left when they sinned. But they returned after Yom Kippur, you see, they returned on the 15th day of Tishrei, you see. So those clouds returning, really what it means is we, God now, not only has renewed his contract with the Jews, but the Anogah Sayyichud remains with the Jews on a permanent basis, you see. And therefore, as a result of that, that is what sukkus is. Sukkus means that we are, God forgave us for the Cheto Egel, and we are now part of uh, the Anogas HaYichud, in the sense that the Anogas HaYichud, the clouds return, that symbolizes that the Anogas HaYichud now again guarantees the survival of all the Jews, but the Jews as they come descend from Yaakov Avinu, the 12 tribes. Not from Moshe Rabbeinu. What the Jews do is we descend from the 12, the 12, 12 tribes, from Yaakov Avinu, and that's what's guaranteed. You see? And Sukkot commemorates that. <clears throat> you now understand what Sukkot really commemorates. It commemorates the reinstatement of the agreement of God that only the Jews can do the tikkun, and therefore the Anogas Yichud will only apply to them. That is an event which is unbelievable, because it meant that we are now guaranteed to survive in the form of who? Of the descendants of Yaakov of Vino, as the twelve tribes, you see. <clears throat> so therefore, that is what Sukkot commemorates that idea and the what to when you have a contract right 
then you need both sides to sign on that contract. So what is our commitment in the contract? So the first thing we do is we go into a sukkah. Now the essential mitzvah of the sukkah is the schach, is the covering. What does that mean? Because it is the schach that symbolizes the anogas ha'yichad, the protection, the eternal protection of the Jew, that he cannot be destroyed, you see. And of course, we go out of our house into a sukkah because really, our whole life is a sukkah. There's no such thing as a permanent house. You see, we know that. We've been in exile for thousands of years. There's no such thing as a house that you can feel safe and secure. I mean, just take a look at the diaspora. In Spain, they were doing great. And then all of a sudden, they got kicked out of Spain unless they converted to Christianity. So there's no such thing as permanence in a house or shelter, right? So God says, you need to go into a sukkah, right? Because a sukkah is really where we live. Oilam Hazra, this world, is temporary. But the main thing is the schach, and that has certain laws. Because a schach, the roof, which has to be made of certain material, that symbolizes the Anogas HaYichud. You see, the acts of God that guarantees survival and that we will do the tikkun. And that's why we are in a sukkah. That's also why, you see, there's tremendous simcha. Why does sukkah have such joy? The joy is that we survived, that God renewed his contract with the Jewish people, and that we're the only ones that can do a tikkun, you see, and therefore get Olam Habo as a full nation. I mean, that's a tremendous simcha, joyous concept, you see. Of course, if a non-Jew wants to do the tikkun, fine, but he has to become Jewish, halachically. Uh, so he can also do the tikkun, but he must do it as a Jew, not as a non-Jew, you see. So that's why there's such incredible simcha by the uh, by Sukkot, you see. <clears throat> and that's also Lulav and Esrig and Hadassim and Arobos, uh, they symbolize us. There are different symbols that you can use, you see. But those four species together, what do we do with them? We shake them, you see. And what we're really saying is uh, we will always uh, perform the commandments no matter where we go, you see. <clears throat> so our shaking the lulav is really, that's what it is. You know, if you look at the gematria of Esroig, you know, Esroig is Aleph, Tov, Reish, Gimel, right? So it's 400, uh, tough, uh, it is uh, 610, okay? And with the three species, Hadassim, Arobas, right? And the Lulav, 613, you see. So therefore, we are saying to God, by shaking the Lulav, that we will always be in your service. That is our signature on the document, the contract, uh, that God renews with us, you see. And what is his signature? His signature is Shminat says, because shaking the Lulav and Esri is only for what? It's basically only seven days. The eighth day, there is no shaking. In fact, there's, not, there's no mitzvahs actually to perform. Why? Because the eighth day symbolizes God's signature in the sense that, you know, he will supply what he promised to Jewish people. <clears throat> you see, not only that, but you think about that, the essence of Sukkot is the restoration of the Anogas HaYichud to the Jewish people, the reestablishment of the whole agreement uh, that we are the nation that will do the tikkun, and we are the nation that will be in Oilam Habo in the future world of all the peoples of the earth. That's why the Jews are indestructible. No matter what you do, you can never destroy them. And therefore, we say Hushanas. You see? In fact, we say that. Hushano, Lamantra, Lokeno, Boreno, Doshenu. 
Uh, that's why, you see, we say, Hoshano, save us. Because among the essence of the entire Sukkot is the reestablishment, the restoration, you see, of the agreement between the Jew and God, you see. So like I said, the Schach symbolizes, right, his protection. The Lul of Esrig, Hadassim and Arava symbolize our agreement that we will do the mitzvahs no matter where we are. And that's why we shake it in all the different six directions. No matter where we are led, we will worship God, the Taryag, you see. And that's why there's such, like I said, Simcha. And Shmini Atzeres represents his signature. Now we can ask, what about Simcha's Torah? <clears throat> you know, we would have thought that maybe we should have, you know, celebrated Simcha's Torah on, Shav- on Shavuos. Why Sukkot? Because the idea is that since everything is now rededicated, right, to the, in the terms of the contract between us and God, as a result of that, <clears throat> right, we are therefore on Shemini um, the, the our dedication to the Torah has been completely renewed because we are now guaranteed survival. So therefore the Simcha of Simcha's Torah is really the reinstatement again that we will observe the Torah, you see. Because the Torah of Shavuos, in many ways, Moshe Rabbeinu destroyed it, you see. And we, he, he received a second Luchas, you see. And therefore, on Shemina says, which is God's signature on the contract, everything is reinstated. So our Simcha of Torah which was renewed on when, on Shmini Atzeres, because that's God's signature, there's such incredible joy. And that's why it happens on Shmini Atzeres, you see. <clears throat> In any case, so we, we, we get some type of grasp of what is going on. So we realize that the event of Sukkot, Sukkot comm- commemorates an event, right, which was life-saving, to the Jewish people, you see, it was a, re, uh, a rededication, right, reinstatement of the contract between the Jews and God, where we would now be the subject of the Hanogah Sayyichud, which is a guarantee to do the Tikkun, ultimately, and to get Oilam Habo. Very important concept. <clears throat> now, there's something I wanted to also mention. Very interesting. Okay. Last Hanukkah, I gave a Shia. That Shia was last year, 2021, right? I gave it on Sunday, I think it was, uh, um, I gave it, yeah, last Hanukkah. And Hanukkah was on November 28th, and it started Sunday at night. And I mentioned then, you see, that that Shabbos of last year, has a convergence of seven different aspects of holiness. <clears throat> and I will tell you what the significance of that is. The first thing is Shabbos. The Kedusha, the holiness of Shabbos, happened then, right? Hanukkah of last year. The second thing is that the parasha that we read then was Miketz, Right? And Miketz is all about Yosef getting out of prison. So that's the second very important idea. Third idea, you see, is of course that it was Hanukkah. That's the third Kiddusha, or aspect of holiness, of that Shabbos. Hanukkah. The fourth idea is that Shabbos itself uh, <clears throat> was Rosh Chodesh. Teves, uh, it was Rosh Chodesh. It was the beginning of the new month called Teves, you see. Uh, and that itself, Rosh Chodesh, is always a day of holiness. Now, what was fascinating about that, right, is that it was Rosh Chodesh Teves. Uh, now, I had mentioned uh, quite a while ago, Teves is the mazel of Esav. Right. Esav has certain months, Esav or Edom, uh, certain months where his mazel 
is supreme. So if something bad happens to the Jewish people, much of the time it happens in Teves. Apparently that's the month that he can argue best, you see. So Rosh Chodesh of that Shabbos of Hanukkah was Teves, was the month of Esav, which is interesting that it happens in Hanukkah. So in a certain sense, Hanukkah is a protection, you see, against Teves, the Rosh Chodesh of Teves, which is interesting, you see. <clears throat> now, besides that, right, something else. Now, <clears throat> what is important to know is there is a great, uh, one of the uh, uh, Chazal, he's a, he's a Rishon, <clears throat> means he lived hundreds of years ago. His name is the Rokeach. And the Rokeach said that Kabbalist, and he was a tremendous Kabbal, Kabbalist, Kobol. And he said the following, that the eight days of Sukkot, because there is only eight days in Israel, there's only eight days, only in America is there a ninth day, uh, but the eighth day, eight days of Sukkot parallels the eight days of Hanukkah. Isn't that interesting? That means the eight days of Hanukkah parallels the eight days of Sukkot. So in a certain sense, right, we are also, in a certain way, the Kedusha of Hanukkah now. Kabbalistically, this is what he says, you see. <clears throat> now, therefore, one could say, we know that on Sukkot, there's a concept called Ushpizen. And the Ushpizen is Avram, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, uh, and... Um, uh, David and Yosef, right? <clears throat> because they are the pillars of the avoider of a Jew, and so on, you know. Um, and therefore, each one comes for one day. Avram was the first day of Sukkot. Yitzchok is the second day. Yaakov was the third day. And then you have Moshe and Aaron, fourth and fifth day. Then you have Yosef on the sixth, and David Amelach on the seventh day, which is Hashanah Rabbah. In any case, it comes out that on the sixth day of Sukkot is the Ushpizen, or the holiday of Yosef and Sukkot. Now what is interesting then is that if Hanukkah parallels Sukkot, that means the sixth day of Hanukkah would be the Ushpizen of Yosef, if you follow the reasoning of the Rekeach. But the sixth day of Hanukkah right, a year ago was Shabbos. So we could say that the Ushpizen of Yosef, since Hanukkah parallel of Sukkot, was actually that Shabbos. So you actually have six very interesting concepts last year of Hanukkah on the sixth day, which was, of course, Shabbos. But there was something else that happened, and that was spectacular, what was it? A total eclipse of the sun could be seen over Antarctica. Right. A total eclipse of the sun. That means on the month of Teves, because it was Rosh Chodesh Teves, right, <clears throat> there was a total eclipse of the sun. And the Gemara says that a total of eclipse of the sun is very bad for the mazel of the Goyim, especially Esau, Edom and so on. Very bad because they reckon their time by the sun. So therefore, when the sun is eclipsed, it's a very, uh, it's a tremendous sign that their muzzle will be tremendously harmed. So I remember I said then that if that's the case, if Rosh Chodesh Teves, which is the month of Esav, that's his muzzle, actually has a solar eclipse, Right? That means we are going to witness, I said then, something very bad is going to happen to Esav or Edraim. That's what I said then. And, of course, I had no idea what. But I said it would be very fortuitous for the Jews. Very bad for the Goyim. Because it's not just a soul, total solar eclipse, right? In general, it's bad for Esav like I said, but it's happening on the muzzle of Esau, which means that it's going to be very bad 
for Esav. Did that happen? Yes. Let's take a look at what's been going on. On February 24th of this year, 2022, Russia, under Putin, attacked Ukraine. And what that does is it is now, uh, what do you call it, activated everybody against Russia. Uh, Russia, in many ways, is a finished country. Why? First of all, you have a tremendous amount of sanctions against Russia. Second of all, Russia has now destroyed itself internationally. You know, they're finished diplomatically. The world will not forgive what they have done to Ukraine. <clears throat> now, if you recall from the previous Shurim, I said that Ace of Edoim, right, Ace of, and then the Torah says that Ace of is Edoim. The Gemara says that Edoim is Rome. Rome is Christianity, and Christianity is Western civilization. And I had said that Western civilization has three sections, right? Because Esav had three characteristics, right? Uh, he was a tremendous Balgaiva, haughty and arrogant, tremendous fraud, impostor, and tremendous Baltaiva, pleasure-seeking individual. So I mentioned that Western civilization also has these three ideas. Russia, which is basically atheistic, tremendous arrogance, so that represents the arrogance of Esav. Europe is fraud, because Christianity in many ways is a fraudulent religion, because more people have been killed in the name of Christianity than all other wars combined. And America, right, so that's the fraud, and America is the pleasure of Esav. Well, let's take a look. Each one of these sections, in many ways, is collapsing. On February 24th, it started. Uh, so Russia is collapsing, right? Why? Because it is now a pariah nation among the nations of the world. And as long as Putin is head of it, it will not be restored. And he's not going anywhere in any case. And there are tremendous sanctions against Russia. I mean, Russia is really like a leper, you know, what's called Chutzla Machner out of the, uh, the uh, group of nations and, and so on. So that's Russia. Europe is suffering terribly because of the, the uh, inflation. is killing Europe. Uh, there's no oil. They say there will not be any oil to heat the homes in the winter. And they're saying that many people are going to die in Europe. Then you have tremendous weather extremes. Europe is doing very, very poorly. And America, of course, is being destroyed by Biden. I mean, we know what's going on with the border, right? The crime in all the cities. Then you have the inflation. I think now is 8.5 or 8.7. But people say, really, it's over 11. In any case, you have the gas prices, the grocery prices, supply chain shortage, and so on. America really is collapsing. It's really what's happening. You know, people are not making it in America. So what's remarkable is right after Hanukkah in February, Putin started the collapse of Edom, of Esav. Uh, and what is amazing is that that solar, total solar eclipse that happened on the Shabbos of Hanukkah, right? The Shabbos of Hanukkah, like I said, was the Rosh Chodesh uh, of Teves. That total solar eclipse actually addressed itself to the muzzle of Esau. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. So in many ways, it's a, an astonishing <clears throat> uh, corroboration, you know, of that understanding of last Hanukkah, which is really very, very interesting, you see, you know. But in any case, this is what's happening, you know. What is also interesting, like I mentioned, is the Rukeach. Rukeach says that Hanukkah and Sukkot are parallel. And the truth is, there is a, an idea that unites them both. You now understand that Sukkot is what? Sukkot is, right, is the reinstatement or the rededication or the reestablishment of the agreement that we have with God. That we are guaranteed to survive in Oilam Habo, to do the Tikkun. And to be in Olim Habo, in other words, the Jewish people 
are indestructible, and they're guaranteed ultimately, however it works, uh, to do the tikkun or rectification. Hanukkah, same thing. The Greeks, right, they, uh, what do you call it, wometame, they defile the entire temple. And the people, the uh, Matisio and so on, they were able to throw the Greeks out, and they rededicated the temple. See, there you are. It's another rededication. <clears throat> so, in that sense, Rokech, of course, is correct. Hanukkah and Sukkot are both reestablishments or rededications of the holiest aspect of Judaism. One is a contract, right? And the other is the temple, the whole sacrifice, the whole avoider of the temple, the Beis Amigdash. You see? <clears throat> and then there are other uh, parallels and so on. But in any case, that is really very interesting. You see, the, these ideas. Well, you now understand <clears throat> what Sukkot is really all about, right? And that is why Sukkot commemorates what? The Anonia covered the clouds of glory. Because we now understand what the clouds of glory really were. They were the symbol of the Anonis HaYichud. You see? Uh, <clears throat> so it's not that we are celebrating or commemorating the restoration of clouds. No. It's we are commemorating the reinstatement of the agreement that God has with the Jewish people. That we will be the nation that truly does the tikkun, and that we will be in Olam Habo, and that's guaranteed, you know, um, to, to happen and so on. And therefore, we, we have tremendous amount of simcha, joy, on Sukkot because of that. And that explains, and as I mentioned, the symbolism of all these mitzvahs, exactly what is happening on Sukkot. Any questions? Any questions? Hi, Rabbi. Hi. Okay, so um, it was a beautiful class. Um, so my question is, is that, so if Aharon HaKohen was the reason why we were able to get the Ananeha Kabod, then why isn't his day more pronounced? Why does it always fall out on a Chol Moed? Who did you say, Aharon HaKohen? Yeah, because of Aaron HaKohen, we were granted Anane HaKavot with his merit, because of his merit in the desert. That was why we had it in the first place. Correct. So then but it why came back after Yom Kippur. You know, it came back after Yom Kippur because God forgave us when Jews. he died. What was but that? Then it, left us, it left us when he died. Yeah, because, well, the agreement remains... You know, uh, for what what that probably meant, it wasn't necessary to protect the Jews with the anonym. I mean, it doesn't mean that the Jews were vulnerable. That that's not what it means, you know. <clears throat> but uh, what it probably does mean is that the protection that the Jews have to survive remained. You know, it could be also that those clouds of glory are a spectacular miracle. They were spectacular because it surrounded them on all six sides. So it could be that you needed to have that symbol. It was not only he could remains, but to have that incredible symbol on a daily basis, maybe it could be that it needed, you know, the merit of Aaron HaKoyen. But that, that would exist even without Aaron HaKoyen. You see, I mean, if you think about it, every time you woke up in the morning, you would actually be surrounded by clouds. You know, it was just incredible. And then there was a fire at night that led the Jews and so on, you know. So maybe that needed a, t a tremendous merit for the symbol to be so spectacular. You know what I mean? Got it. 
feels it. It's going to... Rabbi. Yeah. So now you believe that last year Yosef was released uh, Hanukkah, correct? Yosef was relieved, released on Rosh Hashanah. But well, what's interesting, year, this year, by the way, it's going to be the same thing. Everything yeah. I mentioned that happened last year is going to happen this Hanukkah. The only thing that I'm not aware of is there won't be a total eclipse. Yeah. But you can have yes. six ideas. What? Maybe there will be, and we just don't know. We don't know. We don't know. But right now, I mentioned seven things. Six of those seven will happen this coming Hanukkah. Because Hanukkah Re- again is Sunday this night. Thing. What? 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 Repeat it. What are the six things? Well, the first is that it's, uh, it's uh, Shabbos. Six. Right? It was on Shabbos is one, the Kedusha mm-hmm. of Shabbos. Mm-hmm. And then you have Mikates again. Mm-hmm. Right? And then you have, uh, it's Hanukkah, the holiness mm-hmm. of Hanukkah. Then you have, uh, it's Rosh Chodesh. Oh, wow. Right? It's, my, it's again, it's Rosh Chodesh. And it's Rosh mm-hmm. Chodesh Teves. And it's the Ushpizen of Yosef according to the parallel between Hanukkah and Sukkot. So it's six of them, which is interesting. So, so what does you know, it mean for us? What? What does that mean for us? We don't know. We don't know what, what's going to happen as a result. I mean, right now the whole world is going through a tremendous turmoil and upheaval. We're talking about Russia, Europe, and America. Tremendous turmoil. Rabbi, so it should you be hear what... Did you hear what Rabbi Pinto said before Yom Kippur? No. Can I read it to you? Yeah, of course. Um, okay, so he was saying, um, and I'm going to read it in English. It says, uh, we are approaching Judgment Day Yom Kippur, which is a very holy day. So know that we are entering an incomprehensible time, the next days and next weeks. Everything we have seen is nothing compared to the things that are going to be. There will be seven wars before the Mashiach comes. So anyone who thinks that nothing will happen, many more serious things than what happened in history are going to happen. But whoever is glued to God, nothing will happen to him, and he will have a great heavenly salvation. Is that it? That's it. Uh, Well, I spoke about this, and the reason why, because the parallel to this is when Moshe Rabbeinu went to Egypt. It got much worse because of the Xera, the decree of straw. And I mentioned way back, you know, in the Great Reset, that lecture, that, uh, you know, before God brings the Mashiach, he must satisfy justice. And that's what's behind the tremendous upheavals, you see. So it's not just justice to the non-Jews. He's got to satisfy justice even the Jews. You know how many really great, uh, tremendous Jews have died in the last uh, two and a half years since COVID hit? It's incredible. It's almost like God is emptying out all the tzaddikim. Who's left? You know, <clears throat> so that's all part of the satisfaction of justice, actually, to help. Because uh, each the death of each tzaddik is a kapora. Is an atonement. But it's really incredibly difficult. Tremendous amount of, like I said, people, tzaddikim, died from COVID or whatever in the last two and a half years. And that's the upheaval to the Jews. We're losing tremendous amount of spiritual people. But for the non-Jews, just take a look. Europe is about to go through a winter without any heating oil. You know, the inflation is killing Europe. You know, Russia's got these incredible sanctions, right? And we don't know what Putin is planning. You know, if Ukraine keeps, they seem to be winning over Russia, which is an incredible, humiliating defeat of Putin. Because it now looks like Russia has a third world army. It's an incredibly inferior army because Ukraine is beating them. And they're regaining the territory that they lost. And I think that 
they are continuing to push back Russia, and they may even want to take back Crimea and the four different regions that Putin annexed. If that happens, I believe that he will launch a tactical nuclear weapon and destroy an entire city because he's desperate to save face. I mean, Putin, I'm sure he realizes, made a tremendous mistake. He incredibly overestimated the might, the power, the strength, the superiority of his Russian army. He was completely taken in. He looked like a fool. And you don't want to make Putin look like a fool because then you corner him. And it's very dangerous to corner a man like Putin. So you never know. But if he does do that, if he launches a nuclear weapon against a city in Ukraine, you can't believe what's going to happen in the world because America will respond in a way you never know. I mean, I, I don't believe it's going to happen, uh, th- uh, World War Three, uh, but he's going to do something. And you may see maybe what he's referring to, uh, Rabbi Pinto, is the retaliation, right, that uh, Putin is going to take if Ukraine does take back Crimea and the four regions that he annexed. That can easily be the catalyst for an unbelievable destruction that's going to be going on. And part of the problem is Biden has severely weakened the United States in terms of the army and so on, you know. Uh, So that can easily launch a tremendous amount of uh, upheaval and destruction if that happens. But the underlying idea of all of this is the satisfaction of justice because the world does not deserve Mashiach. So therefore, justice has to be satisfied before it can happen. So, and that's really the meaning of the Gemara. The Gemara says that it has lists a whole bunch of things that are really terrible in terms of what will happen before the Mashiach comes. And that's why the satisfaction of justice. It seems like, Rabbi, maybe all of these uprisings all over like Iran now, and even the Israeli government's going to have another election. Yeah. Um, maybe that's making Hashem wants everyone to not like our government so that we would want Mashiach in the whole world. Oh, yeah. I mean, that certainly is going to uh, make everybody wish that the Mashiach was here. No question about that, because it, um, I mean, it may get really, really very bad. And there's a lot of supply chain shortages. You know, there are countries that are going to starve because the fertilizer, the price of fertilizer is through the roof, grain, everything. So when you have a country that is not eating, that's very dangerous because that country will rebel and that will create tremendous instability in the world all over and everybody's going to suffer. You see, we live in a, we, we really live in a very dangerous time. Really very dangerous. I mean, the world has not been threatened with a nuclear weapon for what? Uh, you know, uh, 60 years? And also, all of a sudden, for the first time, the world is being threatened with a nuclear weapon that actually may happen because of the forces that will force Putin to launch that weapon is being directed against them. I mean, that's what they're doing. Uh, what, what, uh, what, what the Ukraine is doing is that they are forcing Putin, in a certain sense, to launch a nuclear weapon to remove the incredible humiliation, like I said, you know? Does anything like, does, does Motzei Shmita bring any... Does that have holiness? Well, yeah, also? exactly, because Maitoy Shmita, the Gemara says uh, that uh, Mashiach comes on Maitoy Shmita. And we are now actually in Maitoy Shmita, right? So the time is very appropriate. Timing, you know. But we really live in a very dangerous time. You know. How do we prepare I mean, ourselves for a nuclear war? 
mentally, and spiritually. War. As Jews, what do we do? What I would recommend, you know, what I would recommend, I think, the most important thing, and there's many things, obviously, to keep the mitzvahs and so on, is to get the sutton off your back. Because the only way a Jew can be harmed is by kitrugim, where the sutton is going to point his finger at you in the heavenly tribunal and say, you see what he did? The greatest way is to protect yourself uh, from that accusation, which is the real reason why bad things happen to Jews, uh, is to tshuva is one, and the second way is be very careful with Shmir Saloshan. Because if a person does not speak Russian Hara, 99% of Kitrugam cannot be directed at him, at the Sultan, uh, or I should say at him, because he doesn't speak Russian Hara. Russian Hara is the primary way a person initiates the judicial court against him, because it activates the, uh, the Kitrugam the prosecutions of the Sultan. So I would say be very careful about your speech. Do not speak Lashon Hara. Learn the laws. Because that's your, that's your greatest protection, is to, is to get him out of your sphere, you know, where he's not going to point his finger to you and try to initiate a judicial case against you. So as long as you don't speak Lashon Hara, that's tremendous protection against that. That's what I would say. You know, you have to stop the prosecutions. I mean, besides the mitzvahs, the mitzvahs and whatever, Torah, you know, and so on. But I would say that that would be it, you know. And Tfila, you have to pray. You have to pray that you will be able to, you know, survive the the coming uh, Armageddon. Actually, that's almost what it is. It's an Armageddon. And you never know. We're heading down that road. You know. We are heading down that road. So to end on a good note, Rabbi, <laughs> can you uplift us? <laughs> Well, the good, the good note is this, is that after this comes the redemption. That's a good note. See, it's one thing if this happens and then everything is finished. No. Uh, all of this is to allow the redemption to occur. That's the end does game. It, does it say anywhere how long this Armageddon lasts? No, uh, well... It doesn't really say, but we know in Egypt it lasted, what, six months or whatever, you know. doesn't say. But it, it's, you know, it's almost like, it's like, like I say, you know, the good news is that this cannot go on forever. The world cannot destroy itself. God will not allow that. And that ultimately speaking, the Mashiach comes right after this. Because this is the whole thing that's stopping him is the satisfaction of justice. Once that happens, then it's over with. What? When do you think this is going to unravel? Unravel? Yeah, when is it going to happen? Which one? The bad part or the good part? What? The bad part. The bad part. You could tell us both parts. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the bad part is happening now. Because like I yeah, said... It's going to really get so bad, it's going to get worse. Yeah. Because the trigger of all of this is that Ukraine is actually being victorious. And you're dealing with an individual that will not tolerate this type of humiliation. And if they proceed, like I say, if they take back Crimea and they take back the four regions that he annexed, it's over in the sense that he's going to launch or else he's finished. But you isn't know? that where the U.S. should step in and try to make peace between the two of them? You know what the problem is? Because Biden is a moron. They don't care. 
you, we're not dealing here with Trump. You know, Trump was very dealt very well with with Putin. You know, Putin respects Trump because he's strong and he's sechletic. He's logical. We're dealing with a guy that you know, dr- d- uh, what do you call it? Uh, drips into a soup. You, you know what I'm saying? We're dealing with a guy who's a moron. Right? It's, it's, it's a guy's guy's a you know buffoon. So who are we dealing with, right? He's going to sit and neg- go negotiate with Putin. You know, Putin wants to eat him for breakfast. <laughs> That's who he oh. is. So you know, how good can we feel with this? This guy, plus Obama, plus whoever else is directing him, you know, uh, Ron Clegg, uh, whatever his name is, you know, Clayman, whatever his name is, and uh, Susan Rice, whatever. They're idiots. Because you see that they've done things which are stupid. So how intelligent can they be? You know, they've done things which are absolutely idiotic. You know, the fact that America is disallowing energy, the coal, the oil, you know, the gas. It's unbelievable. That could solve the whole problem, you know? And imagine how much money they could uh, make by selling oil uh, to, to Europe. So they stopped it all. And the, and the, the whole inflation, the supply uh, chain uh, crisis, all of it is due, due to Putin. This is... Um, this is Putin, uh, not Putin, excuse me, Biden. Biden. Yeah, this is Biden's doing, all of this. Uh, this guy is the worst president in U.S. history. You know, mm-hmm. he's the worst president, no question about that. He has completely yeah, destroyed the Amer- Amer- America. I mean, it, it, Afghanistan is, was a showpiece. That's when you saw how stupid he is. I mean, a 10-year-old kid would not have done what he did in Afghanistan. Everybody knows that. Uh, and that's what the Russia made him appear, and everybody saw what kind of an imbecile this guy is. And he's the one who's going to negotiate with Putin? Or he's gonna, the guy who's going to save us from a nuclear Armageddon? You know, if anything, it's not, just, it's not just him. It's the people directing him. You see how stupid they are, the mistakes they make. You know, uh, it's just incredible. What, it's like you can't even make this stuff up. It's so bizarre. You know, but it, it, look, we're all, you have to remember one thing. We are all in the hands of God. Uh, nothing will happen unless the Rebunsham wants it to happen. Nothing. And in the, in the end, that's the greatest nechoma, consolation. That's why really you should not worry. Nothing can happen unless it is the will of God. Period. Very important idea. But you have to do your part. Correct. So that's why, you know, the part is to adapt more. Oh, yeah, that clearly you have to do. Yeah. 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 I mean, a very good sign will be, I mean, in the next four weeks, we're going to have two major elections. One is for the House and Senate in America, and the other is Israel. Oh. Israel is November 3rd, I think. And America is November 8th. Uh, those elections are critical, you see. So if, 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 um, if the forces of good win, then you know that there's going to be a reversal. But if the forces of evil win, which is the Democratic Party and so on, then that's very bad news in terms of what's about to happen. But in the end, you have to remember one thing, you know, it's all up to the Bersham. Nobody can do a thing if, um, unless God wills it and he agrees to it. You know, Putin is in the hands of God. You know, he thinks he's, uh, he's the... He's acting on his own. He's not. You know, he can't do what the Bonsham doesn't want. You know, <clears throat> and so on. So even if it Thank gets you. worse, it'll be a, probably a, continu- a continuation of what's happening now. But we have to wait for, uh, in four weeks to see which way the Xero is going to swing. 
Thank you, Rabbi. So if we have, if we have Mashiach Ben Yosef actually maybe, you know, getting ready to yeah. start doing something, what might he be doing? What might he be doing? Probably he needs a, a tremendous rehabilitation. He's been going through incredible yisurin for who knows how many years, you know, and so on, you know. But he, what he would be doing is gearing up to, you know, to uh, release his tremendous spiritual powers in whatever form that is. That's what he would be doing. But just remember, we are in the hands of the Rabbi Shalom, and we have the Anhogah Sayyichud. We are all guaranteed to survive. That's what Sukkot is about. We're guaranteed to survive, guaranteed to, uh, to uh, be in Oil Mahabo, and hopefully guaranteed to be in the Messianic era. You know? Amen. And that's really just to think about. Remember, like I say, you know, nothing can happen unless the Rebunsham wills it. Period. doesn't make a difference, you know, what Biden is doing. The Rebunsham allows him to do this. Because it's part of the agenda of God, you see. So he conforms to the agenda of God. That's the only reason why it's happening, <clears throat> you see. But I, I told you what triggered the whole thing, right? You remember that? Yeah. What triggered all of this <clears throat> is uh, June 2015, when the LGBTQ became constitutional. That was the trigger. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. What was that? That Ruth Bader Ginsburg who made Castro law. Yeah. I mean, she's part of that, yes. Tremendous rishas. Very evil woman. You know. <clears throat> but when that happened, they initiated the end. And that's why Trump came down that escalator and he said, I'm running. He said that, uh, I don't know, like 10 days before Anthony uh, Kennedy uh, voted for it, you know. But when they did that, that triggered the end. Like I said, I gave a whole shit about that. Mm -hmm. You see. So that's it. So the bad news is that, you know, it's going to be a rough time. The good news is that right after the rough time is over, it's not another continuation of more rough times for another thousand years. It's over. It's the end. And the end is supposed to be something which is beyond our comprehension. The goodness, the, the light, uh, the unbelievable, um, the spirituality, the uh, benefit of mankind will be spectacular once the evil is gone. So you just have to ho hold on, you know, hang in and trust in God. You need to have be talking. Very important.